Good morning, everyone from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Uh, my name is Alexandra Kuzmanovic, and this morning I have a great pleasure to talk to our chief scientist, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, and our assistant uh, director, assistant director general for access to medicines, vaccines, and ph pharmaceuticals, Dr. Maria Angela Simao. Uh, good morning, Dr. Sumia, and good morning, Dr. Maria Angela. Uh, we are eight months in the COVID-19 pandemic and WHO has put strong efforts in convening uh, countries and partners within the ACT Accelerator initiative. Can you please explain to our viewers what is the ACT Accelerator? Dr. Sumia, do we hear you? Or Dr. Mariangela, we are connecting remotely today here we here we are. We have good morning, Dr. Mariangela. How are you? Good morning. Good afternoon for those who are already on another time zone, and uh, it's very, it's a pleasure to be talking to you today. And we'll try to to make uh, a lively conversation and try to bring some information to you that will help to understand the context that we are living in. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? There yes. is some who yes. just that they can hear me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I can't hear anything. Okay. Uh, we, Dr. Sumia, cannot hear anything. So there's some glitch yes. on our on our side. So I'll Apologies continue. For that. Right? Okay. Okay, can I continue? Yes, please. Yes, yes. So apologies for the interruption. We are, we are learning, still learning to live with these virtual interactions and we are getting better and the platforms are getting better too, but it's still not the same thing, right? So what, what is the ACT Accelerator? In April this year, you know, where it was very, very clear since the beginning of this pandemic that the world need a much more collaborative space to make sure that we could speed up the research and development of, of tools that would help to, to conquer, to, to address this pandemic, to address the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the huge impact it's having in the world. But at the same time, that it would ensure that we had what we call an end-to-end -end process, that whatever you you put on the pipeline of the research and development, that these tools at the end of the day, when they are ready, they are available for real people at country level. You know, that's what we call the end-to-end. -end. So the, this ACT Accelerator was formed by through a coalition of global international organizations, global and international organizations, uh, was fundamental in putting this together. WHO today hosts hosts the coordination hub. There are several organizations that are partners with us, depending on the, each area. And one of the questions that would come up is what does it do actually, right? We, we say we are working with four pillars, right? One is focusing on vaccines, and we can speak a little bit about each one of them, right? On, and like I said, vaccines from the research and development part until uh, we have the regulatory issues and the, the acceptance at country level and that in due time we'll have immunizations campaign happening at country level. Uh, there's another pillar on the therapeutics. At what, which are the, the drugs? Because there are lots, you know, more than 1700 trials going on with around 200 uh, drugs, medicines to some old and some new to treat uh, this virus. Uh, so there's the therapeutics pillar and the uh, diagnostics pillar, which is also because it's a new virus, we needed the first test that was available is a test that's very complicated because it has to to use the swab you know it's a it's a PCR test it has to be done in a specialized lab right so it's not an easy to scale up and we needed to invest a lot on the research and development of tests that are easier to to be used by health workers be at a hospital or at a 
at the health center level. And then there's a fourth pillar that's called the health system connector, because in order to have all these pieces working when it comes to, to them being available at the, at the local level, you need at national level, you need to have a health systems that can work uh, with these products and that have the, the, the uh, for example, the, the necessary uh, inputs regarding like protective equipment that we call PPE for health workers, that you have masks, that you have all the uh, gowns, the, everything that the health worker needs to protect himself, and also has the ventilators and oxygen and oxygen meters to uh, address patients who are hospitalized. So this is in a nutshell how this act accelerator is organized with four pillars and WHO plays a role across all of these pillars. Back over, maybe Dr. Sumia wants to complement. Good morning, Dr. Sumia. We are glad that we got you connected as well. Thank you for joining. Good morning. Would you maybe like to, to, to add what is the objective of, of this ACT Accelerator initiative and how it will help us to, to save lives from COVID-19? I think Mary Angela has talked a little bit about the accelerator and how it's set up and who the partners are. You know, the idea was that uh, in April when this was uh, conceptualized was that you need to come together. Essentially, if every organization and every country tries to do this on their own, it's going to be long and hard and difficult because there are strengths and weaknesses. And this challenge basically is a global challenge. And so you need the public sector, you need the private sector, you need the scientists and the academics, you need civil society, right? And you need, of course, the resources. And uh, as Mary Angela said, you know, you, the immediate needs are to be able to detect people. So you need diagnostics to be able to treat people so that you can save lives. And then in the, in the medium term, you want a vaccine so that you can bring an end to this uh, reduced transmission, you know, make it much more manageable. And so this is when, you know, the concept of the, the act is a, basically a, a global coalition of, of uh, institutions and countries coming together with, you know, WHO, of course, leading as a global health agency, but you have CEPI, which, you know, was set up basically to develop vaccines for diseases like this. You have Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, that has a long history of providing hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine to children all over the world. You have the Global Fund that's had a fantastic impact uh, in reducing deaths due to HIV, TB, and malaria. You have UNITAID, which, which basically focuses on scaling up innovations. Um, you have the World Bank, and then you have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that have been funding innovations and scaling manufacturing for a long time. So bringing all of these uh, organizations together with, of course, the support of all our member states and, and the other stakeholders I mentioned, the private sector is very important. We cannot scale anything, whether it's a drug or a vaccine without the private sector. And so you have the associations of the manufacturers of vaccines and drugs also you know, joining in to this coalition. And, and there are two goals. The first one is to accelerate research and development, make it as fast as possible, unprecedented speed um, and scale is what we're looking at, but also access. And I think it's, we are very, very clear right from the beginning of this initiative, there is no point in developing new products and tools if you cannot distribute it around the world to people who need it, regardless of their ability to pay. And so really these are the two goals and that's really the mission of, of this whole uh, enterprise. Um, and we're now about four months into this. We've made tremendous progress in all these uh, areas, in therapeutics and diagnostics, and as well as in vaccines, where things are really moving along very, very well. Uh, and so we hope that this would actually result in very concrete things that, that will benefit people. It's a, it's a very practical and a pragmatic exercise, not something which is just talk or, or theory. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sumia. I see that we're already receiving a lot of questions, but for those who are not sure how to ask their questions on Twitter, please use the hashtag AskWHO. On LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, leave your question via comment section. Um, Dr. Sumia, you just mentioned that um, we are we are trying to speed up the process um, in developing these these vital tools and also to ensure access. And one of our viewers just left a comment: um, if we if we do this process in in a very fast way, are we missing to uh, see some long term effects or long term side effects from these products? Yeah, that's a great question, and this is something that you know I think everyone must understand that just because we talk about speed and scale, it doesn't mean that we start compromising or cutting corners on what would normally be, you know, assess. The process still has to follow the rules of the game, which is that you go through the process of clinical trials. And here, particularly, I'm talking about drugs and vaccines. Diagnostics has evaluation methodology. But for drugs and vaccines, which are given to people, you have to test their safety, First and foremost, most important, and the efficacy. That is how effective is the drug. If it's a drug in, in trying to reduce death or a drug which is trying to um, uh, reduce the need for oxygen or ventilation, that's what you need to test in a clinical trial. If it's a vaccine, you're looking at can the vaccine really prevent people from getting the infection or prevent people from getting seriously ill if they get the infection compared to those who don't have the vaccine. And these clinical trials progress in stages. You start with a few people, usually a, a dozen or two, to test safety. Then you go into a few hundred people to look at both safety in a larger group and immunogenicity, which means the um, how good is the immune response. And then you get into a phase three trial, which uh, is done in tens of thousands of people, where you're really looking at how good is the protective response. And you're also looking for safety signals, rarer side effects. And then even after the uh, vaccine has met the benchmarks that have been set and it's been licensed, you still do something called post-marketing surveillance, pharmacovigilance or safety monitoring, which is you continue to collect data on the safety of a new va vaccine or a new drug for at least a couple of years after it's introduced. So there is a system in place, has been in place for a long time. This is what regulatory agencies follow. And this will be followed for these products as well. The way we try to shorten the timelines is by anticipating doing things quickly, trying to harmonize efforts, especially between the regulators, and also putting lots of investment into manufacturing well ahead of the results of the trial. So normally, a company would wait, see the results of the trial, then start scaling up. But here, you're investing in advance, uh, what's called at-risk investment, uh, so that there are places around the world that can start manufacturing this uh, as soon as the, you know, even before the results are available, actually. And if the results are not good, well, that resource can be turned to doing something else. So that's how the timelines are being shortened, not by cutting short the, the, uh, the actual testing of safety or efficacy. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumia. Dr. Maria Angela, you explained that ACT Accelerator has a few pillars. So COVAX is a pillar focusing on vaccines. How many countries are part of, of um, uh, this pillar and how can they join to, to be part of COVAX and ACT, uh, ACT Accelerator? You see, because one of the big challenges we have, especially in the developing world, and we have the history of past pandemics like the age one and one show that the world didn't have access to the vaccine for against the age one and one on a timely fashion. Okay, we had uh, the high income countries, rich countries getting the vaccine first. And then when it came to distribute the vaccine to lower and middle income countries, the, the pandemic had already won. The difference we had this time is that this pandemic's not going to go away anytime soon. That's, uh, that's what we have been seeing so far. Now, even you, you try to say, no, it's going to end now, it's not going to end soon. It will end one day, but it will, it needs help and we need to work towards it. I'm saying this why because uh, we, we have WHO with Gavi and other partners are, are making a huge effort 
to ensure what we call equitable access to the, a vaccine, let's say, or therapeutics or diagnostics, might be, but we're focusing in this moment on equitable access to a vaccine. What do we mean by that? We mean that countries in the North and the South, you know, all countries who join an initiative that that's the COVAX facility. And now, right now, we have, I think, 172 countries that have joined. They would have access to the vaccine on a timely manner. Everybody would, you know, that next year we have a, a, a vaccine that has proven, like Dr. Sunia said, that's both safe and that it works against the virus, right? What we call efficacious or effective. Once we have that vaccine, one or two vaccines, uh, there won't be enough to vaccinate the entire world. So what we are aiming at, organizing with countries, joining a, a global facility that's hosted by the Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, is that countries will have access to the vaccines as they come into up to 20% of the population until the end of next year on a very timely basis. So we wouldn't have like rich countries just getting it first and poorer countries getting after. We are working very hard. So like I said, 172 countries have joined uh, this facility trying to do uh, a better job than we did in the past. You know, because all, all tools that work against COVID should be global public goods, right? Things that will benefit humanity. And this pandemic has shown us that the, it, no one is safe until everybody is safe, all countries. You know, there's no country that will be able to, to not to have more cases while there are cases elsewhere, right? So, so, so we need a, what we're saying. We are working towards a global solution that gives the, the countries the best chances to access a safe, efficacious, and affordable vaccine when they become available. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mariangela. Um, we got a question from our viewer on Twitter. Has WHO be able to um, lead or influence discussions with Gavi and vaccine manufacturers, as you mentioned, on access, but also on pricing? You want to take it, Sumya? So should I? Yeah, I can start. So, so yes, I mean, the COVAX facility basically has been set up to be able to uh, to have that leverage because of the, the volumes that will be procured through the facility. Um, as you know, the, the COVAX facility um, is a pooling mechanism that will supply, that will buy vaccines from manufacturers and supply them to countries, both countries that are high income countries that will pay for their own vaccines, as well as the countries which normally get Gavi support. So there are 92 countries which are low income or low middle income or some of the very small countries, which will be supported uh, through development aid. But there are at least 79 countries now that have expressed an interest, which are the upper middle income and high income countries that will buy. So, so once you have these commitments, you can make advanced purchasing commitments to companies and that helps them to plan and also helps them then to scale uh, the number of doses and to reduce the price accordingly. So that's usually the rule that the more the more the volume you're buying, the better the price could be. Um, the facility will obviously have uh, entered into a lot of negotiations. And currently what we're hearing from the manufacturers, many of them are that they uh, either want to supply it, um, you know, at a not-for-profit basis. So just the cost price plus a little bit to cover their expenses. There are some manufacturers who have proposed a tiered pricing. So a lower pricing for the low-income countries and then you know higher for the middle and then higher for the high income so there's uh, there's that um and then the type of vaccine it, it also makes a difference so there are some vaccines currently which could be in the range of a couple of dollars per dose up to vaccines which are being priced at you know between 20 and 30 dollars a dose and this is dynamic it will change um as there are more vaccine candidates becoming available you know the pricing is going to change but we have to plan right for the beginning when there'll be limited candidates limited choice so yes um, on the one hand you have the push funding which CEPI is doing which is the R&D funding so there's funding uh, 
being invested into the research and development of candidates. On the other hand, you have the Gavi COVAX facility, which is providing the full funding, uh, providing the market commitments and the advanced purchase commitments. So between these two, um, it should actually be able to, to bring uh, vaccines to people at uh, affordable price. And of course, most countries are thinking about how they will um, provide vaccines to their own citizens um, at a no cost or low cost uh, or a cost sharing basis. So that's, you know, country by country discussions also happening. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumia. We have a new question from our LinkedIn viewer. What exactly are you doing to speed up research? Are you giving extra funds to specific institutes? And if yes, which ones? So um, there are different models being followed to speed up uh, research. And maybe Mary Angela can talk about on the therapeutic side, how the Gates Foundation and the partners, you know, Unitaid and others are investing uh, in, in, uh, in both keeping track of what the new advances are, um, supporting some of the studies, but more importantly, planning ahead. So if there's a promising drug that's getting into clinical trials today, are we going to have enough doses available? Is there enough manufacturing capacity available to be able to provide it to people? For vaccines, it's something similar. As I said, there's advanced investments into research and development, which means you know, taking it through the lab studies, the animal studies, the human studies. There's a lot of investment in manufacturing because that is a significant portion of, uh, of the vaccine cost is to scale. You know, This is the first time that the world will need vaccines in the billions of doses. Currently, we mainly have a large childhood immunization program. We're talking about hundreds of millions of doses. Now we're suddenly talking about billions. And that kind of capacity doesn't exist in any one company. So new facilities have to be built. Uh, and existing ones need to be strengthened and expanded in order to have that kind of capacity. And it's the same for, for drugs as well. If you had an effective drug that saved lives, you would want hundreds of millions of doses of that uh, drug uh, or product to be available all over the world. And that is a big challenge, particularly for things like monoclonal antibodies, which, which are currently in clinical trials, but for which there's limited capacity in the developing world. So th this is, these are the kind of issues that you know, these um, agencies within the ACT Accelerator are grappling with and trying to find solutions for. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sumia. Dr. Mary Angela, here is a question on, on therapeutics. Um, what is the stage of drug trials? How will uh, developing countries benefit from these drugs? Or are they getting this? Is there a chance for them to get these drugs on fair pricing? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question and, and one that everybody should be asking. Thank you for, for the question. Uh, there are so many. You know, you, you have two different types of, uh, of drugs, right, when you're talking about the trials. You have drugs that already exist in the market for other purposes, and they are, we call them are, as being repurposed. They have been studied for another reason, right? An example was, for example, the hydroxychloroquine, which is a malaria drug, and it was studied to, to see if it worked uh, against uh, COVID-19, against the, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, and it showed it did not work, right? And we have uh, drugs that are used for HIV that also showed that they did not work. And then we have new drugs, you know, drugs that are being developed now, and Dr. Sumia just described that, like, for example, the monoclonal antibodies, which we call them biotherapeutics. There are some that are promising ones. They have, um, they have some restrictions in use, for example, because most of them are injectable, right? So not everybody. It's even doing the trials with healthy patients is, is a, is a, is a challenge because people don't like to get injections, right? So, so they are promising drugs. Both drugs, uh, we call them the, the usual pharmaceuticals that we use, we, we call them small molecules, right? There are some, a few promising drugs now on phase three trials uh, with small molecules. And there are a few monoclonal antibodies, which are the biotherapeutics uh, being developed for COVID, specifically for the virus or uh, to boost the immune system. 
you have a we have a lot of disinformation misinformation uh regarding the the trials and the drugs that can be used and you know we do who last week launched the guidelines on the use of corticosteroids especially uh, with an emphasis on dexamethasone but not only on dexamethasone because you know that this this, this virus it causes in the body a hyperimmune inflammatory reaction you know and the corticosteroids which are anti very strong anti-inflammatory drugs they have been shown to be useful to decrease mortality in severe patients that are getting worse because of this hyperimmune response so we have very few uh, tools right now but we have been seeing now from very few tools that have proven to be effective and and like i'm i'm citing dexamethasone and some other of the corticosteroids because who just launched the guidelines on this uh, but you you we are also seeing a, a situation where the, the the intensive care units in many countries are learning how to manage better the clinically the patients okay so so it using all the tools available we have one specific drug that was a repurposed drug initially uh, used to try to use for ebola patients which is remdesivir who showed a, a small benefit in decreasing number of days in hospital no. but we still haven't we still do not have a uh, antiviral that works specifically under, against this SARS covid 2 we will know by the end of the year which of these studies we will we you know this is studies that are ongoing and I'm, and I'm, let me explain something because it's very important sometimes people see a small study with 50 people 60 people and they think that's it no we are talking about very robust studies we are talking about studies that analyze people who take the drug and compare them with people in the same situation who don't take the drug we call that randomized controlled trials and this is the only way by comparing two populations that you can know for sure if this drug made a, a positive effect or not you know? so this these big studies are still ongoing with several drugs and we are hopeful we will see some results in the next months Thank you very much, Dr. Mary Angela. Uh, Dr. Sumia, a few of our viewers are asking how many vaccine candidates are there in the COVAX facility? Also, they're asking if WHO is coordinating those vaccine trials. Yeah, so um, let me first explain the difference between uh, COVAX portfolio, which is, uh, we sometimes use that to refer to the portfolio of um, vaccine candidates being supported by CEPI. I talked about the push funding and there are about um, nine candidates right now, nine companies that are being supported by CEPI, but another 20 or so that are being considered for funding support. So that's purely to for investments in the research side of things. Then I talked about COVAX facility, which is going to be this big pooling mechanism for vaccines. Now, now there, Basically, the facility is open to vaccines from all over the world. There is no restriction on who funded it or who developed it. The, the, what the vaccine needs to prove is that it is efficacious and safe and that it meets the benchmarks that have been set by WHO and by the regulatory agencies like the FDA, the EMA, etc. So WHO has a big role here, obviously, because we will be asked to provide an opinion on whether a vaccine uh, is ready for, for use, whether it can be pre-qualified or whether it can receive an emergency use authorization. Um, and so we're preparing ourselves uh, for the assessment of all of these vaccines that are going to start coming through once there are results. So there, there's an independent expert group that's being set up called the Independent Product Group that will advise Gavi and advise the facility on which vaccine candidates to invest in based on many criteria. One, of course, is the scientific data on the vaccine, but also things like what's going to be the potential price, how easy is it to scale up. There are some uh, platforms, some technologies which are much easier to 
make in bulk than others. So that could be a criteria. The storage conditions, you know, do you need a minus 20 or a minus 80, or can you store the vaccine at two to eight degrees, which of course makes it much simpler for use in, in many countries. And so there will be these criteria that this committee will look at and advise Gavi on where those investments uh, must go. And again, initially, there may be limited choice. There may be one, two or three vaccines that are approved. But as time goes on, hopefully there will be more choice. There will be uh, also a possibility to choose certain candidates for certain settings or certain age groups, etc. So as time goes on, I think this will be uh, changing. But at the moment, it's going to be based uh, by on, on a clear set of criteria um, and will be, uh, will be decided not by one or two people, but by an independent international expert advisory group that's now being set up uh, exactly to advise on this. Thank you very much. Uh, viewers are always interested when um, an efficient vaccine will be available. And once we have it, if we have it, um, how it will be distributed equally, how it will come to the people who need to, to receive it to first, as we are aware that we won't have enough doses at the beginning for, for everyone. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, I think many people think of the vaccine as a silver bullet that will arrive on the 1st of January and that will basically solve the world's problems. It's not going to work like that. Um, we will start seeing the results of some of the trials, which are already now in phase three, the advanced stage of the trials by the end of this year or uh, early in 2021. Then, you know, the, it has to go through this process of evaluation and licensing. Um, and then the scale up has to happen, the manufacturing, the shipping of the doses. Um, we're looking at the middle of 2021, an optimistic scenario uh, for, for a limited dose of vaccines to arrive in countries. And this is where the allocation framework that Mary Angela has been leading is very important because I think countries and people need to recognize that the first doses of vaccine that become available, we must prioritize to whom that goes, you know, the people who are at highest risk of getting the infection. And, and most people agree that frontline workers, including health workers and other essential workers, are those that might be the ones who first should get these vaccines. And then gradually, as you get more doses, you start covering the population. You first cover those who are at high risk, the elderly, you know, those who have other diseases, which makes them at high risk, etc. Slowly, you start covering more and more of the population. That's going to take a couple of years. And before that, we need to continue the public health measures that we have shown to be effective now. So it's really important, I think, for people to know that when vaccines come, they will take time to be scaled up till everyone in the population or at least till 60 or 70 percent of people get that immunity, which we talk about, you know, the population or the herd immunity, which can really slow down transmission. We're not talking about eradicating the virus here. We're talking about reducing the kind of impact that it's currently having on society, on lives. And so that's going to take certainly up to 2022 you know, to see that change happen. Until then, we people have to be disciplined. I think that's really the only solution going forward. Thank you very much, well, Dr. I comment here very quickly because I, I, I saw some questions on herd immunity on, on the chat on, on the, the side here. And I, I, I think there's a lot of misconception about herd immunity as well, you know, because herd immunity is a term that's used to always referring to uh, achieved by vaccine, you know, it's not by immunization. Uh, and herd immunity to be achieved by natural infection in the case of this SARS-CoV-2 would mean uh, the death of countless people. You know, we are not, WHO does not think we will achieve herd immunity without a huge life costs, without a vaccine. Okay, so when you're talking about herd immunity, we are talking in the context of immunization, not in the context of the natural history of the disease we've left unchecked. 
Thank you very much for that clarification. We spoke about vaccines, we spoke about therapeutics, but we also have a pillar on diagnostics. So our viewers are asking, um, are there available and accessible quality tests and what's the status of, do we have maybe some new diagnostics, di diagnostics in, um, in pipeline? There's a lot of innovation going on in the diagnostics area. And as all of us remember at the beginning, we had very limited tests. It was RT-PCR tests. You need specialized laboratories to do that. It's still the gold standard today. But today we, we are in a situation where there's been a lot of development, especially in the rapid tests, uh, both rapid antigen tests, which tell you whether there is infection or not, and it can be done on a, on a sample of the respiratory secretions, and also antibody tests, which tell you whether you've been exposed uh, to the virus at some point. So the antibody tests are more useful for, for the public health authorities to assess you know, what proportion of their population has been exposed. And they can do it periodically to see you know, what's happening in the community. But it's the um, PCR tests and the antigen tests. And there's been a lot of progress. The price is coming down. Um, it is possible that very soon we will have these tests available, even the paper-based tests you know, that people could even use for self-testing. Um, at home and, and could then they could have mass testing, you know, where people are congregating and or going to work and so on. And so I think the, um, the way we approach testing and our strategy is also changing and will change as these become uh, available. So it's a very good uh, point. And testing makes all the difference because once you are able to detect somebody early in the, in the stage of the infection, there's a much better chance that you can provide them the suitable care, monitor them and prevent them from deteriorating and, you know, uh, getting into severe problems. And that's one of the reasons now we are seeing much lower case fatality rates today than we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, when people were only tested when they were very sick and showing up in hospitals. Today, it's the reverse. People are being test tested so much more that many of them are asymptomatic or with very mild symptoms. But it helps to know because two things. One, it uh, make sure that you don't get sick because you're doing the right things that are doctor monitoring you. Secondly, it helps you to stay isolated. So you're cutting that chain of transmission. So the more people you can diagnose when they're infectious and isolate, the less the chances of onward transmission in the community. So I think a really important uh, field and uh, definitely something that the ACT Accelerator has been discussing a lot and putting a lot of thinking into. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunya. Dr. Mariangelo, do you have anything to add to this one? No, no. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We are running out of time. I thank all our viewers for their great questions and for watching us from Scotland, Uganda, Canada, Nepal, Papua New Guinea, Bangladesh, Tanzania, the US, Haiti, South Africa, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, Nigeria, France, Poland, India, Armenia, Turkey, Iran, Singapore, Sudan, Pakistan, and many more. Um, I thank Dr. Sumia and Dr. Mariangela for their time and for uh, taking all these great questions. Um, please follow our website or our social media channels for any updates on vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, and any other work that we are doing on COVID-19. Until next Wednesday, please stay safe.